So, um, so yeah, so welcome. The goal today really, um, I had a little slide somewhere that was gonna share the goal with you, but it's pretty simple. The goals are basically, um, at the end of the session, um, we'd like you to have the skills to be able to go in and create a test or quiz in Sakai and to go in and grade a test or quiz in Sakai. This is really sort of basic stuff um, just to get you to where you need to be. Um, there may be, um, again, it's gonna be basic. There may be some more complicated things that you'd like to see and we encourage you to, to contact us directly by emailing keepteaching at duke.edu and we can connect you with one of us, one of the consultants or one of the learning experience designers um, who could actually help you with your specific situation um, if you need to do something beyond what we're gonna go over today. Um, it's only gonna take probably about 30 or 40 minutes to go through the bits that I wanna go through. So we may have some time for some more advanced questions. Um, or there's been, um, there's been a few sessions about rethinking assessment in this sort of new paradigm that we're existing in. Um, so it may be that you wanna talk a little bit about thinking about how to redo some of your assessments at the end of the session too. We'll just kind of let it flow um, once we're done with the, the basic setup of what, I've, what I wanna go through. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, let me share my screen with you. What I'm gonna start with is um, I've got a test course in Sakai and I'm going to start by um, showing you how to add the tests and quizzes tool in Sakai if you've not done that before. Um, and then we'll go into actually creating the tests and quizzes themselves. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so um, this is just a typical sort of empty-ish looking Sakai course. Um, and you'll notice that over here on the left hand side, there is no tests and quizzes tool because I wanted to show you exactly how you would add that if you don't have that added by default. Um, so the way you do that, if you have not done so, is to go into the site info tool and select manage tools. And then you have a list of all sorts of tools and you will just look for uh, tests and quizzes. Click on that, go to the bottom, hit continue. It'll verify that you wanna add tests or quizzes and you say finish and voila, it is now over on the left-hand side, tests and quizzes. So um, that was just a quick, easy, how to add tools in Sakai, <laughs> bonus content. So um, now that we've done that, if you go into tests and quizzes, what you'll see is basically a list of um, assessments that you may have already created. If you haven't created any, then it'll be blank, obviously. Um, but what I wanna do is just jump right into the process of showing you how to create a quiz from scratch. Um, using what they call the assessment builder. So we're gonna go ahead and click add, which is the button right up here. It doesn't look like a button, but it is. Um, click that and it will take you into the create from scratch tool. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you type in the name of the test. We'll call this, um, let's call this uh, woo, Wednesday's test. And you have two options. You can create it using the assessment builder and you can create using markup text. We're gonna do the assessment builder right now and then I'll go back and show you um, the neat trick that you can use to do uh, markup text, um, which I'll explain a bit more about in a second. So I'm gonna say create using assessment builder and select create. And then it pops you right in and expects you to start adding questions. Um, so there are a number of different types of questions that you can create in Sakai and I'll open up this drop down menu and just show you those. Um, Obviously the most common ones that you think about are like multiple choice, true, false, short answer, fill in the blank, things like that. Those are all available in here. And there are some more complicated questions too. Um, so some of them that are interesting are numeric response. You can actually ask students to um, calculate something and put a response in and the response, you can actually tell Sakai to expect a range of answers. So in other words, you can have a range from like three to four would be the right answer. So 3.5 is correct. Interesting. Um, student audio response is a really interesting one. You can actually ask students to go in and record um, audio, uh, to record their answer in audio form, which might be great for like foreign language teaching or if there's some sort of a response that you want students to give you, um, you can make the audio response an option. Um, Hotspot is another sort of fascinating one that I thought I'd point out. What Hotspot does is it gives you an opportunity to ask students to find a specific region of an image. So for example, if you were asking them to identify um, a body part, for example, if it was a medical test, um, then you can specify what part on the image is the correct part and the students have to sort of click on that, click on that hot spot in order to get credit for the question. So there's some interesting ones in there in addition to the usual sort of um, boilerplate question types. Um, but having said that, let's go ahead and start with one of the boilerplate question types. And um, we can do like, for example, a multiple choice question. Um, so what you do is you just say, I would like to create a multiple choice question. 
Um, the first thing it asks you is for the point value for the question. And you can put that in there as one point, two points, whatever you think is appropriate for your test. Um, the question below asks you if you want students to be able to see how many points the question is worth while they're taking the exam. That's a choice that's up to you. I don't know why you wouldn't, um, but you could um, choose not to if you wanted to. Then for a multiple choice question, one of the next questions it asks you is, um, do I, does this question have one correct answer or does it have multiple correct answers? So you make that selection here. Um, single selection and multiple selection basically gives you an opportunity to um, select, have multiple correct answers available for students and they have to select either all of them to get the right answer, to get full credit, or they select some of them and get partial credit. So a little bit confusing, but that's the whole point of the multiple correct um, answer section. So. Let's say, for example, I'm going to put in a question. The first thing it asks me for is the question text, obviously. So um, what it basically gives you is a pretty boring little box just to type your question in here. So I can say, um, I'm going to do a simple question. Which word has four letters? So I can type. <clears throat> so that's pretty basic. If you just want to put the question in, that's fantastic. You also have this ability up here. You see where it says, show all rich text editors. If you click that, what it's going to do is it's going to open up sort of like the Word um, toolbar kind of thing or the web toolbar that you're used to seeing for editing uh, questions, things like that. So you get a little bit more expansive options. So if you wanted to make the question big and bold, you could do that by opening up um, this tool. Um, but once you do that, it does it for every single box on the page, which is a little bit, um, maybe a little strange. but. Um, if you choose to use that option, just be aware that's what it'll do for you. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it in there. Uh, which word has four letters? So the next thing it asks you for is um, correct answer and some distractor answers. So what you need to do is select, you just type into each of these correct answer sections, or sorry, answer sections, um, one of the choices. So in this case, I'll put bug. That's obviously not the correct answer. So I'm not going to select the little circle box here for the correct answer. Uh, the next one will make rabbit. Uh, the third one will make leaf, and that is the correct answer because it has four letters. So I'm going to select the correct answer radio button here to indicate to Sakai that that is the answer we're looking for. Um, and then I'll put a fourth distractor thing. So grass. Definitely keeping an outdoor theme here today, I think. Um, if you want to put more than three distractor answers um, and you want to have additional answer possibilities, you have that option here by insert additional answers. You just select how many more potential answers you want. Sakai to offer and it will add those boxes in for you. Um, the next question asks you if you want those answers to be randomized, which is kind of nice. So um, it might be an anti-cheating opportunity for you there. So if students are going to say, oh, here's my, my answers to the uh, multiple choice question that I had in the test today. I had A, C, B, D <laughs> uh, for my four questions. If you do randomize the answers, then it's basically going to put a different, um, a, put the answers in a different order while keeping obviously the correct answer available. So that's kind of a nice option if you want to try to um, curb a little bit of the option for cheating. Um, require rationale is an interesting option. It's if you select yes, then when a student selects an answer, it leaves a space for them to type why they selected that answer. Um, obviously, it can't, Sakai, the system cannot grade that rationale. Um, it'll grade the correct answer for you, and then you can go in and read the rationale and um, perhaps give back some partial credit if the rationale is good, but the answer is wrong. So again, that's an option for you, but that's what require rationale can do. Um, a couple of different things in here that are kind of useful. Um, Assign to part. Parts is just a way to break the quiz, uh, the test up into little sections. So if you were going to have a very long quiz, you might want to break it up into um, several parts. So if this question was intended to go into one of those parts, you would select that here. Um, another option is, um, if you have created what they call a question pool in Sakai, which is on that main tests and quizzes page, um, then what it will do is it will save the questions and you can use them across multiple assessments, which is kind of a nice feature. So if you've set that up and you think you might want to use the question again, either in a final exam for the same course or in a future course, you can copy question pools from course to course. So if you teach the same section in the future and you don't want to have to retype all the questions, you can save those questions to a question pool here. So if you, as you type the question in, you say, yeah, I want it to go into my question pool or my chapter one question pool, whatever you've preset up. So it's kind of a nice feature um, so that you don't have to do the same thing over and over and over again. 
which is the definition of madness, right? So, um, okay, um, moving on, there is an option at the very bottom here which allows you to give immediate feedback to a student who puts the answer incorrectly or incorrectly. So in other words, if I type in here, um, yes, that's great, which is pretty banal, but it's a, it gives them immediate feedback to know that they got the answer correct. Um, or I could say, no, sorry, the uh, answer was leaf as incorrect answer feedback. And I'll show you in a little bit. Um, when they get that feedback is a choice you can make as well. I said immediate, but it's not immediate unless you choose for it to be. Um, you can tell the system when you want students to be able to see what their answers were, what they got correct, and any feedback that you provide. You can set that later, and I'll show you that in the settings section in just a little bit. So, um, all right. So that is kind of a basic setup for a multiple choice question. Pretty simple. And now you see it comes across looking as you would expect. Which word has four letters? You see the distractor answers and the correct answer marked um, here. So, um, and it also shows the feedback that I decided to put in there as well. So, okay, so let me show you one or two more question types just because I think these are probably the most common ones that you end up doing. Um, let's do a, um, let me show you, ah, you'll see two, add question above and below. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter which one you choose. So let's do a fill in the blank. This has an interesting little quirky thing to it, but it's also sort of useful. So some of the same questions here, um, assign a point value, we're gonna make it one point. Um, display the point value while the student is taking the exam. Yes, I'm gonna leave that in there. Um, and it gives you a nice hint here that when you're doing a fill in the blank, you put curly brackets around the word that you're expecting students to fill in and it will leave a blank in its place. So for example, if I put in, um, someone left the, and the answer is cake, <laughs> out in the rain. Um, then when I go ahead and create that question, it's going to show to the student as someone left the blank out in the rain and ask them to put what they think is the correct answer in. So um, a couple of options down at the bottom. One of them is case sensitive. If you um, want them to capitalize a proper name and they don't capitalize a proper name and you don't want them to get credited for that, then this is where you select that. Um, you have the option to do multiple blanks in a question and what it's asking you here with mutually exclusive is do you want them to have um, both answers correct in order to get full credit for the question. Um, and then you can also choose to have it ignore spaces, um, which is more useful for the kind of example that they're giving you here, which is where students are giving a, a mathematical sort of response. So in other words, if they do two space times sign, is it the same as two times sign without spaces? Yes, probably. It's up to you to make that choice though. So, Okay, and then down below you've got the same sort of um, options that you had before. You can add it to a part, you can add it to a question pool, you can provide feedback. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and save the question and now when we go back into the assessment you can see that it is now asking or showing the question as someone left the blank out in the rain and shows the correct answer is cake. So, um, kind of an easy, kind of a nice thing to do. Uh, let's see. Is there one more? Oh yes, I wanted to show you quickly um, short answer essay. The most important thing to remember about this one in particular, I think, is that um, because it's a short answer or an essay question, Sakai can't auto grade this. The other two types that I just showed you, uh, multiple choice and fill in the blank, Sakai will make an attempt to tell the student or tell you whether or not the student got the answer right based on the student's response. Um, but for a short answer or for an essay, obviously you have to go in, read it, and place a grade in yourself. So um, let's say, for example, in this case, we're going to ask a short answer question, and it's a short answer, so it's going to be worth five points instead of one point. Um, then we just basically ask what we want. So I'll say maybe describe um, the process of sublimation. And basically what students are going to get is a big box just like this where they have to describe the process of sublimation and submit that to you. And when you go into grading, you'll see the student's answer and you'll have an opportunity to assign the number of points that you think the answer is deserves. That makes sense, okay. Um, one thing that's a little bit different in here, in addition to providing feedback, you also have the option to provide a model answer, which is kind of interesting, because um, you don't see that in some of the other question types, but you can go in there and you can tell a student, you know, um, for example, if you were asking a question like, um, yeah, describe the process of sublimation. You might provide a different question and say, um, if I were asking for you to describe the process of evaporation, here is the answer that I would give. So make your answer about sublimation match this question or this model answer as much as you can in order to get full credit. 
So that's kind of a nice feature to have if you want to be able to, to model answers for students. So um, I'm going to go ahead and save that one. And now you see it just basically shows up on my quiz as just a question. Describe the process of sublimation with no correct answer listed, obviously, because um, there's not one in this case. So, all right. So that was three basic question types and showing you how to create those inside um, the assessment builder. Um, pretty cut and dry. Again, I think if you are interested in using some of the other question types instead of spending time going into it right now, um, I would suggest that we either can maybe talk about it a little bit at the end of the session if we have some extra time for questions about those different question types, um, or you can contact us, um, come to office hours or contact, contact us at keepteaching at duke.edu and we can walk you through um, some of the intricacies of those different question types if you'd like to do that. Um, okay, so for now, let me go back um, into my assessments, list of assessments. And Wednesday's test is here and it's a draft. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a new assessment and I'm gonna call it Thursday's test. And I'm gonna show you how you can use what they call markup text to add questions to an assessment. Um, and this might be easy if you already have, for example, a Word document with questions that you've given to students in the past um, in paper form, and you want to import those into Sakai. Um, with a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of work um, in order to help match what Sakai is expecting in terms of markup language, you can actually have it import the questions with the correct answers and some feedback and things like that. So um, this time we're gonna call, we're gonna ask it to create uh, the test using the markup text. So I will say create. And when you go in, it looks very different. Um, it's basically got a big blank box where it's expecting you to paste in some question text. Um, and there's also some useful instructions and examples over here on the right hand side that I'll point out. Um, and I'll go ahead and open general instructions and show you. Um, the basic idea here is that what you're going to do is you're going to give it a list of questions in text form um, using what it expects the format to be to indicate the right answer and to indicate a couple of different options that you can choose. And then when you click next, it's going to import each question in as a separate question into your assessment. So again, like I said, this is particularly useful if you have um, already written out tests in Word <laughs> or another word processing tool um, and you want to get those into Sakai as quickly as possible. So how does that work? Um, well, let me see if I can show you. I have a get this up here. I have already created a Word document that has, can you see the Word document? Is it showing that or is it still showing this? Okay. All right. What I'll do is I will just copy this over and bring it into Sakai so you can see it. I think I'm only sharing that particular window right now. So let me get back into Sakai here. Okay. So what I've done is I've created five different questions using markup language and I'm going to paste that in right now. Okay. So you can see that, correct? Yeah. Good. Okay. So what you do is the first one is the multiple choice question with one correct answer. So what Sakai expects you to mark, how Sakai expects you to mark up the question is by putting in a number for the question first. So you put one period to tell it's question one. Then in parentheses, you specify how many points you want the question to be worth. And then you ask the question. Then you list the possible answers down below and you put an asterisk in front of the correct answer. And when you import that in, it will know that, that March is the correct answer for that question. So, okay. Um, number two is very similar. It's got the same general setup, but it basically allows you to um, put in two correct answers. So in other words, you're asking students to select all the numbers in the following answers that are less than 10. So you specify that A and B are both correct answers. Um, I also put in there, you see the little, I <laughs> I'm gonna say hashtag, I guess it's a hashtag even in Sakai. Um, hashtag randomize. Um, what that does is it indicates to Sakai that when this question is posed to students, you want it to randomize the answers A, B, C, and D. Um, same as the checkbox when we did it in the assessment builder uh, just a minute ago. So this is how you specify that inside the markup language. Um, for a fill in the blank, you basically do the same thing. You put the question number, how many points it is, and then you put in uh, the question. So Seth's cat's name is, and you put a blank in, and then below you put an asterisk and the correct answer, and Sakai will pull that right in. The next one is um, number four is just a short answer question. So for this particular question, I've made it worth five points, and I've just said, please describe your perfect vacation. 
That's an easy question. I'd be a terrible instructor. Um, <laughs> so, all right. And then question five is one that we didn't look at in the assessment builder, but it's a true false question. And I just put it in here because I wanted you to see that it kind of works like the multiple choice, but it also recognizes true false. So you don't have to type false if you're doing a true false question. You just basically put in point value, the statement, and then you can just type true or false with a star in front of it, and Sakai will recognize that it's a true false question and put the other option in when it builds the question. Okay, so I'm going to hit next, and I will show you how it pulls these in. So this is Thursday's test, and with the markup language, it asks me to verify that everything that it read is correct. So I can go through really quick and just say, yes, that's right, I did ask you to put in all of these different types of questions, um, and it did mark the correct answer for the ones that I indicated in the markup text. That makes sense? Okay. Then I say create assessment. And then that's great. When I click on Thursday's test, you can look and it shows all sorts of the questions are normal, as you expect. Question. Do you have a question? Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, my question would be, so it, the, I guess this is Sakai, Sakai automatically um, grades the other parts except for the short answer, which then the instructor would go in, and where do we have a place on this form to say, oh, well, this person got three points, not five? Yep, so uh, we're just about to go into that. I'm glad you asked. That. Thank you. Yep, perfect. We are, I'm going to show you in my assessment list, I actually created test one the other day, test one completed, which is actually, um, I'm just gonna open it to show you. It's basically the questions that we, um, we just did. <laughs> and Michael went in yesterday and answered those questions for us. So I will show you how you can actually go in and um, grade the short answer and make adjustments to questions or to, to the grades that Sakai has issued um, automatically. So go back to assessments. And if you look at in my assessment list, you see that there is under submitted in the submitted column for test one completed, there's a one. This just shows you the number of students that have actually submitted um, answers, submitted your, your quiz. Um, there's only one person in this class, so it's great, it means we're done. Mm -hmm. um, if you click on that number here, what you will see is a list of the students, actually there's two students, sorry about that. Um, you see a list of the students who have completed or the students in the class and it shows you which ones have completed the assessment. So in this case, Michael Hudson didn't, but our test student whose name is student, first name, student, last name has completed it. So I've got a couple options here. You can delete their submission, which you might wanna do if you're gonna give them a second chance, but don't do that <laughs> uh, right off the bat. Um, and then if you wanna see the student's submission in order to go in and do additional grading or to, uh, to tweak the grades that Sakai has given, all you have to do is just click on the student's name in this list and wait patiently because Mr. Kai is very busy today. There we go. Okay, so inside here, it shows basically the list of questions and the students' responses, and it shows me up top, the question was worth nine points. They answered five, or the t test was worth nine points. They answered five out of five questions and somehow earned one point. So it's good for me to go in here and look and make sure that Sakai didn't somehow um, mess something up. So we'll do that. Um, let's scroll down. First of all, you have a place where you can make comments for the students. You can say, um, you did a great job. <laughs> Just a general comment up here at the top. Um, so looking down at the questions, first of all, you can look and verify. Here's the question. Here's what the student answered. The correct answer is B. So they got full credit for this one full point. Um, that's totally fine. You can make a comment relevant to that particular question here too. So if you wanted to, you could say good work. <laughs> um, move on. In the question number two, select the numbers that are less than 10. Now in this particular case, this is maybe a youth case uh, for what you were just talking about there, Tali. So they had um, the option to choose the numbers that are less than 10. The, uh, the answers were A and D, four and six, but they only chose um, the correct answer, six, but they also managed to choose 19, which is not less than 10. So in this case, it awarded them zero points because they didn't select both correct answers. But I might choose to give them half a point on this. And if I wanna do that, I can do that just by going up here to where it says 0.0, .0 of one point awarded and I can just say 0.5. And that changes the value of what the student earned for this particular question. So I can say in here, uh, I'll give you half. <laughs> okay, you don't have to say that obviously. 
Okay, so next one is a pretty good one. This was the fill in the blank. Um, Seth's cat's name is Beaker. And what the answer key down below is the correct answer. And what Michael put in for the answer is next to the X. So basically he put in Beaker, not capitalized with a question mark. And I think in this case, because it wasn't case sensitive, it probably marked it wrong because he put the question mark in, but the answer is correct. So in this case, I would probably go in and award him full credit for that. Um, despite his lack of confidence. So um, <laughs> I can put in there, yes, uh, or nothing. You don't have to put a comment in for students either. Um, so finally, question four, or not finally, but question four or five was the question about describing your perfect vacation. And you can see in here that this basically gave him an opportunity to just write what he wanted to write. Um, so this is where I would go in, I would read the answer, make an assessment about how many points I think it's worth and award those points right up here at the top, just like I did when I was changing um, pre, pre-assessed point values that Sakai did. So to make it worth five points is a good answer. Um, yes, and I can put in a comment. Okay, all right. And then finally, true, false, down below, sky is blue, answer was true, he said false. We're not gonna give him any credit for that, so we're good to go. Okay, so what I do at this point is I update and it will change those point values and save any particular question, uh, uh, sorry, comments that I made on his test. And now you see over here, on the left-hand side that his score has changed to um, 7.5. And it's got his, the generic comment that I gave him there, you did a great job, um, is in there as well. You have an adjustment option here as well. So for example, if you are um, looking through here and you say, well, I can't really give a half value on this, I'd rather it be an eight. You can do that straight from this screen too and just make it an eight if you want to. Um, just click update. You can do that just by looking down the list of students and quickly changing all the decimals up to full, full value or, or whatever. For whatever reason, you might want to make an adjustment. You can do that right here on that screen. So, okay, so that's kind of the grading process. Um, pretty simple. It's nice um, if you have a mix of question types, then it's nice that Sakai will take care of some of the grading for you <laughs> um, and allow you to go in and, and do the more complicated and make adjustments where, where it's wrong or where there's subtle nuances and whether or not the answer is correct. So, um, okay. All right. If that all makes sense, um, let me pause for a minute. I want to go in and show you some of the different settings that you can, um, that you can assign to an assessment before you give it to students. But before I do that, let's just pause for a second. I want to see if, uh, is there anything in the chat, Michael, or does anyone have a particular question about anything that we've gone over right now that you want to get out before you forget? Yeah, there are a couple <clears throat> of things. Okay. Um, we should probably show them like how there's those little documentation links for how to do each question type in the markup text. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Cause we just had general instructions up before. Yep, sure. We'll do that real quick. So if you are choosing to use the markup text, then you notice over on the right hand side, it shows you actually has some links here that show you the specific uh, process that you need to follow in order to mark the questions up in a way that Sakai can read. So for example, let's go in and say, um, fill in the blank. It basically tells you the same sort of thing. You just have to prefix the correct answer with an asterisk and put in a blank and it will remember that for you. So um, yes, that's a good idea. There are, other, there are other question types as well. The multiple choice asks you to basically do it the same way that I showed you. Um, you put in um, the number of points in parentheses after the question number, type the question name, type in your correct answer and distract your answers and make sure you put an asterisk in front of the correct answer. So. Yeah, but those are, that's, I'm glad you pointed that out, Michael. Those are all available just to the right of the place where you paste in all your markup text in the assessment, um, markup assessment entry screen. Okay, something else? Question? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> suppose I have a, a quiz 10 minute and written on PDF file mm -hmm. and need to be graded by the instructor. Mm -hmm. so is the tool can be used such a way I can time the student for 10, 15 minutes and then they submit their quizzes? Yeah, right. so we're just, I'm going to show you that in the settings section here in just a minute. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Yep. All right, anything else about the two sort of, um, two methods of creating tests before we go into those settings? Let me go into the settings. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. There's a couple more questions asking, sure. is there a way 
for your question, they had two correct answers and they got one out of the two. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to automatically assign partial credit? Um, and the other question was, um, is there a way, if you decide that you've got the wrong answer, is there a way to go back and correct it after the test has been taken so that it corrects, it grades it correctly? Mm -hmm. Yep, you can do that. Um, one point of interest, though, is that you don't want to make changes to a test that's been published and is still active for students. Um, you want to wait until the test is no longer being taken by students, then you can go in and you can make changes to the correct answer. And when you finish making changes, Sakai will regrade the test for you and actually update the scores, which is really nice. Um, let me show you the, um, get in here and show you if I can how you would set it up so that that question, for example, that had the multiple correct answers. Um, if I go in and I say, I think this is, I chose the published one. Oh dear. Don't ever hit back in Sakai. I do that all the time. It's never, you always want to use the, <laughs> I'll show you what I did. One moment. Okay, back into my test. There we go. So um, you always want to click this little button up here to get back to your main test and quizzes screen. If you hit back in Sakai, then sometimes strange things happen like what just happened to me. So you use Sakai before, you probably know that. But the quick tip is to hit this little test and quizzes button if you want to go back to the top level. Okay, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit this test one again and just show you. If I go in here and say, uh, well, let's just go ahead and create a new one. If I do um, a uh, multiple choice question. And in this particular case, I'm saying multiple correct single selection. And I say, uh, what number is, what numbers are less than 10? So if I put in four, six, 12, 20, and select these two as being correct and save it down at the bottom. Yeah, so I think it, when I selected single selection, I believe, and I can verify this and make sure that I'm telling you the correct answer. The single selection, multiple selection thing is where you basically tell it, yes, you have to have both of them correct to get full credit, or you can have part of them correct to get partial credit if that makes sense. So I think by saying multiple correct single selection, what I've done in this case is I've told them, yes, you have to have both of them, whoops, both of them correct in order to get the full one point for this, if that makes sense. What I don't know is if it'll automatically decide that because there's two correct answers and you said a full correct answer is worth one, will it give a half credit for half? Not sure about that. Um, let me see if I can find that out for you. I will look and see if I can give you more information about that. There is an option in the actual, like, uh, if you click edit on this question, um, mm -hmm. right next to where you select the button that says um, multiple choice, single correct. Yep. At the top, there is oh. conducted. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's good. And if but, I hit selection, I'm just looking to see what multiple selection says. Oh, there you go. Correct yeah. minus incorrect or all or nothing. So I think I got it backwards. So yeah, so basically you can say in this case, um, Correct minus incorrect would be, yeah, I think that's probably the right way to do it then. So it's like you have to have both of them or you get zero points. Or if you say correct minus incorrect, then, um, then they'll get the credit that way. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, great, great. All right, let me go back on and show you exactly how with these particular assessments, you can make some changes to the settings and show you some useful ones. Um, first of all, when you go into an assessment, um, you have an actions menu right here next to that assessment. And what you want to do is you want to go into the settings option to make these particular changes that I'm about to show you. Okay, so for some reason by default, when you go into settings, it opens up this availability and submissions drop down or basically it unfolds it. Um, there's one above it called about this assessment, which is easy to miss, but I want to start with that one because it's got a kind of an important thing in there that I think you want to see. Um, so first of all, it gives you an opportunity to change the title, um, but it also gives you an opportunity to ask students to agree to the honor code before they begin the assessment, um, which is what we are recommending you do to help um, curb the um, 
urge for students to cheat. And actually there is, there has been, there have been studies done that show that actually asking students to um, agree to an honor code before taking online assessments actually does reduce the amount of cheating. So it's worth selecting this and asking your students to commit to the honor code before they take the test. So that's under about this assessment. And again, when you first go into the settings, it's going to be open to availability and submissions and you just have to open about this assessment above it to get to that option. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, we've also had some faculty in the past who have chosen to make the first question to, to sort of even drive it home even more. They have them check the box to agree to the honor pledge, but then they also make the first question something like, um, here once again is the Duke honor pledge. Type your name below to sign that you agree to abide by this honor pledge. And um, students will do it and it sets in their brain that they really need to be honest about it. So um, something to consider. I know a lot of people are concerned about online assessments and the potential for cheating. So that's one particular way that you can help ameliorate that. Um, okay, so let's look at availability and submissions. Um, so a couple of things that you have available here to you under availability and submissions. One is you can choose the number of submissions that students are allowed to have. Um, by default, it's they get one chance and they're done to submit. Um, you can make it two, you can make it three, or you can make it unlimited. So for example, if it was a practice test, you might want to make it unlimited so that students could take it as many times as they wanted to in order to, um, to practice for the exam or something like that. Um, the next things are pretty important in terms of you need to tell Sakai when to make the quiz available to students. So you select a date and time for the, um, for the assessment to appear to students inside Sakai. So that's what it is available means. And it is due um, is required and tells Sakai when you will no longer allow students to take um, the assessment. Um, so, and here, question from before, if you wanna specify a time limit for the exam, this is where you put that in there. You say, yes, the students can take this exam between March 24th and March 31st. And when they start the exam, I'm giving them a time limit of X number of hours and X number of minutes. So if you want it to be a 30 minute test, you just select 30 minutes. And what it does is it gives them 30 minutes. And if they haven't completed the test at the end of 30 minutes, it gives them a five minute warning. So they know they've got five minutes left. And then when the 30 minutes is up, it saves all their correct answers and knocks them out of the test. So um, I wanna mention that too. This is also another way that you can help to reduce um, the urge to cheat a little bit. If you think about how long it should take, reasonably take a student to answer the question if they know it, um, and then multiply that number by the number of questions in the test, then you can set a pretty good time limit for the test that doesn't allow them a chance to Wikipedia search or to look through their test, textbook or anything like that, if that's the kind of test that you wanna give. Um, but in a lot of cases too, in situations like this, open book tests aren't necessarily the worst thing in the world. So um, just consider that if you want to um, set a time limit, this is where you do that, okay? Um, the next option, late submissions accepted, basically says that um, it will, this is giving you the option to accept a student's one single student response, one single student submission to the test um, up until a certain date, but it notes to you that it was submitted late. So for example, you can say, yes, it's due at midnight on March 31st, but I will accept late quizzes until midnight on April 1st, but just don't expect to get full credit for it, something like that. Um, so it's just a feature that allows students to submit after the due date, but it flags it as late for you. Um, once that, that late submission accepted date passes, then they won't be able to submit anything at all. So. Question? Yes. <clears throat> so if I have one student in the class has a special need mm -hmm. and by Duke required to give an extra time, can you make the accepting only for that student? Yes, alone? you can. And I will show you that in just a second as we scroll. Thank through. you. Yeah, Thank you. no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the next question it asks you is email notification. It's asking you if you want an email notification whenever a student submits the assessment. Probably not, <laughs> um, especially if you have a large class because it'll email you and let you know that a student has submitted the test. So, um, but you can choose to do that if you want, or you can have it send you an email every day that catalogs the number of students who submitted the assessment, that kind of thing too. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then here you have basically a... Um, a blanket option to show the question point values versus hide the question point values during the assessment, um, if that makes sense. Okay, so a um, couple of different things. Ensure students take exams from a specific location is not particularly useful um, at this point because we're all spread, um, you know, 
all over the world at this point. Um, but it might be useful to you to add a message that students see after submission. So you could say, um, thanks for your submission. Um, please read, you know, chapter three before we meet tomorrow, something like that. So kind of a nice opportunity to um, put something in there. You can also send them off to a web page if you want to. Um, so if you have a lessons, a lessons page set up in Sakai, you can copy the link to that lessons page and say, okay, please read chapter three before we meet tomorrow. Um, then do the following steps and then put a link in below if you wanted to. So I'm not going to finish that, but there you go. Okay, so that's basically all the stuff under availability and submissions. Now, this is what we were just talking about a second ago, exceptions to time limit and delivery date. Um, if you have students that need accommodations in your class, um, you can actually change the availability date, the due date, and how late you'll accept late submissions under this section. So basically what you do is you just choose the student from the list of students and then make the exception here um, underneath. If that makes sense. Um, you can also, Sakai has a groups tool. If you have a very large class and you have a reasonably large number of students that have um, accommodations for testing, you could create a group that has those students in it and you wouldn't have to make this individual choice for each particular test. You could actually just say, this is my group of accommodated students and I'm giving them this exception date for this test every time, if that makes sense. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, grading and feedback, a couple different things to show you in here. So if you have multiple submissions available, um, Sakai will ask you what you want to do with those multiple submissions. So in other words, you can have it say, um, give report to you the highest score that the students made out of five submissions, for example, or it'll give you the most recent score out of five. Um, anonymous grading, I think, is more important. This is interesting. If you are teaching a large class and you have TAs that have greater ability in your course, um, you can hide the student's identity from the grader, which helps reduce some of the potential bias in grading. Um, so that's kind of a nice option um, if you want to make sure that you're reading an essay and not thinking about um, what you know about the student already. That makes sense. Um, next, set how feedback will be authored. This is interesting. You've got a little option in here about question level feedback versus selection level feedback. So in that multiple choice question, if you remember when we were creating multiple choice questions, um, at the very end of my list of distractor answers, I had the option to give them feedback on their correct answer and feedback if they entered a correct answer. Well, if I go in here and I select selection level feedback, then basically I can, um, I can make the feedback relevant for each incorrect answer. So in other words, if a student put in B and the correct answer was A, I could say, no, the correct answer was A. What was wrong with B was that blah, 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 blah. So if you choose to do this, um, if you change it here and then go back into the assessment, you'll now see that there are feedback options for each individual distractor answer that you made in a multiple choice question, if that makes sense. Okay, next is setting the type of feedback that a student receives. Um, we talked a little bit about this before. Um, no feedback will be displayed to the student means that there's no opportunity for them to see which questions they got right and wrong. Not ideal. Um, immediate feedback is a little bit dangerous because if they're taking the test, it'll tell them right away, yes, you got it right, no, you got it wrong. Um, it may be that you, and more, more likely that you want to save feedback to students to either be um, the second option or the, sorry, the third option, which is feedback on submission, meaning that when they submit the test and they can no longer make changes or do anything, um, they can go in and see what they got right and what they got wrong. Or the final option, which is um, feedback is available on a specific date. And presumably that would be after everybody has submitted the test so that they can't go and share correct answers and things like that. So if it was due on March 31st, you could say feedback will be displayed to students on April 1st, for example. Okay. Um, and then advanced feedback options just gives you the opportunity to say what particular feedback you want students to see when that feedback is available to them. All right. Okay, and then finally, talking a little bit about layout and appearance. Um, <clears throat> the way that Sakai is set up by default is that it uses what's called random access to questions from a table of content. Random is a strange word. I'm not sure that's what they wanted to use. Um, but the deal is that what they see is one single question at a time, the way this is currently set up. Um, they have the option to move uh, forward and backwards in the questions. Um, and they can also see over on the left-hand side of the screen, sort of a table of contents that has a list of all the questions. So they can go basically to question four, to question five, using the next and previous buttons. They wanna go back to question one, they can go over to the table of contents on the left and, qu and click question one. 
So they can basically go back and forth, change their answers, do what they need to do until they submit the test. Um, if you change that navigation to linear access, then they can only move forward and they can't go back. So they don't have an opportunity to change their answer. There may be situations where you wanna do that. Um, question layout, by default, each question is a separate web page. Um, which is a nice thing in this particular case, the way Sakai is set up is because when they go to the next question, when the setting is set up for each question to be on a separate page, it automatically saves their answer. Um, if you set it up so that the complete assessment is displayed on one web page, then they have to actually physically click save in order for their answers to save when they submit their, their test. And sometimes students don't know that and answers get lost. So it's kind of nice to leave it as a separate web page and just let them use that random access navigation to move through the test. Um, the numbering thing is basically if you're using multiple parts in your test, do you want it to restart at question one when they start part two, or do you want it to be question six? Um, and finally, mark for review is a nice feature. It basically allows students to have a little checkbox next to the question that they can check if they want to go back at the end of the test and review their, their, their answer. So. It, it's sort of the equivalent of like if you were taking a paper test and you say, well, I think I got this one right, but I'm going to come back if I have more time at the end, circle the number. Putting the check in the checkbox allows them to go back and see on their table of contents um, a list of all the questions that they put that checkbox in for so they can go back and review the questions that they marked, if that makes sense. Okay. All right, so those are the settings that you have available to you for the quiz. And when you make any changes to those settings, you want to save the settings to the test and when you publish it, it becomes available to students based on the availability date that you specified. So, okay. So Seth, if you yeah. wanna have, if you wanna have um, multiple parts and you want them to have a certain amount of time per part, do you have to split it up into multiple different tests or quizzes or can you assign time to each part? Yeah, I don't, Think, and I'll verify this for you, but I don't think you can break it up by part, put time per part. I think you basically can change the timing for the entire assessment, but not for the individual parts themselves. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess you would have to do separate assessments. Yep. Okay. Which wouldn't be that bad because you could, you could do three different assessments and give them the same release times and due dates and things like that and just say you've got to do it, you know, that way. So, yep. Mm. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Is there an, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is there an option to say, I guess there is an option to say that during this time frame you have X number of minutes. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Alexa is getting involved here. Oh, um, <laughs> that's great. Um, um, yeah, it, it's, it gives, it lets them know how many, how much time is left. And again, there's a, a warning that pops up when it's five minutes for sure. So that they know, oh yeah, you're running out of time. And do you have an option to include more than one warning or change the amount of time? I don't think you can set that. Um, I can double check that, but I don't think I've seen that before. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll double check that. But they do know, they are aware of how much time they have left for sure. And the warning is kind of like the in your face reminder. So, okay. Yep. Is there a way this, uh, Tolly, is mm -hmm. there a way that this um, test that you are setting up on these pixels is actually kept, that you have a, a hard copy of some sort? I guess you do, because then it's published. So you could just, I'm just thinking that, you know, a master test that I would keep for next year or something like that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that you could do. One is that um, the nice thing about Sakai is that it's, it's con it allows you to connect the courses to each other in certain ways. So if you had an assessment that you made for spring 2020 and you want to use it in spring 2021, you can move the assessment directly from one course to another, um, which is nice. Um, or if you have saved each individual question for that assessment in the question pool, you can move the question pool from one course to another so that you can draw in different questions um, for your new assessment, if that makes sense. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions, Michael? Was there anything up in the chat? Um, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, one, um, 
you might just want to demonstrate these. Some of these have already been answered, but uh, mm -hmm. is there a way to amend a question after students have taken it? Like, let's say there's a potential correct answer that I mistakenly put as incorrect. Can I adjust that and have it regraded? Um, there's the whole regrade and republish thing that we could show, um, which I think actually we have a pretty decent way to show that because I already took that first test. Yep. Um, then test, uh, test dates. Um, can you extend a due date after a, a test is posted and started? And uh, I believe the answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. I've just tried it, but I haven't tried it on a test that has submissions. So mm -hmm. it could be different there. Um, and then uh, is question order always randomized? And no, by default, it's fixed, but you can choose to have it randomized in the assessment builder. So we might want to show that setting. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep, can do. So um, in terms of extending the due date, I think you're right. Yes, you can do that and it doesn't hurt anything. It just means that it stays open longer, meaning that if that's been done once it's open. Um, in terms of changing a question, um, we've, <laughs> there, uh, Sakai has recently been changed that in, in, in such a way that it supposedly allows that to happen so that you can change the question, you can change the right answers while a, while a quiz has been published, but it does not, work well and we don't recommend that. Um, we actually, our suggestion is that if you need to make a change, you realize that you've made a question sort of vague or um, the answer that you selected was not the correct answer. Well, you could do, you can do regrade in that particular case, but if it's about the question itself, um, you're much better off doing something like saying, I'm gonna go ahead and give everyone in the class one point because I gave you a vague question and we're gonna just deal with it that way. Um, it causes some problems if you change a question after it's been published and students are taking the test. Um, we've had situations before where responses, student responses have disappeared um, if you've made a different, uh, made a change to a question that uh, in a test that's been published. So we don't recommend that. Sakai is aware of the issues with it and, and they're working on it. So um, that may be something that you're able to do more fluidly in the future, but um, it's not a good practice generally. Um, there are better ways to deal with it if you end up needing to make um, you know, make amends for students for something that went wrong in a test than actually sort of tweaking the question. Um, so that's the answer to that. Um, what else did we have in here? Oh, you wanted to see if there was a way to show, maybe show the, um, yeah, let me go back into my list of assessments here. I think I can show you how um, we can do a regrade. <clears throat> so it was test one completed. That's the one that you did, isn't it, Michael? Mm -hmm. I think that's the one. <laughs> All right. And it's currently so retracted. Because oh yeah, we edit it with a submission. Yep. I made the yep. See, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Right. Um, okay. So yep. Field. Republish. Oh, okay. No, I need to go to my questions, don't I? Yes, I do. All right. So going into my assessments and going to edit. Yes. So I'm just undoing exactly what I just did there. Okay. So if I go in here and I want to say, okay, something strange has happened in the world and we're now celebrating St. Patrick's Day in November, right? <laughs> um, I go in and I edit that question by selecting edit over here. Then I change the correct answer to November and save that question. Then if you look up here at the top, it says this assessment has been retracted from student view. Click republish or regrade and republish to make it available to students. So in this particular case, if I say regrade and republish, um, it's gonna make the student available, I'm sorry, make it available again for students in the class to take, but it will have changed the score for the student that submitted it because um, he had correctly chosen March <laughs> when March was the correct answer, but now it's November. So it will regrade and take that point away from him at this particular point, if that makes sense. Right. So that's pretty simple. If you need to just change an answer, it's just a matter of changing the correct answer, regrade, you're good to go. Um, okay. What else? There was one other thing and I'm, I'm blanking on it now. Uh, randomizing questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what you can do, several different ways that you can randomize questions inside um, an assessment. Uh, so one nice way to do it is if you actually use a question pool, <laughs> um, you can s tell Sakai, I want you to choose 
from this list of 10 questions, choose five questions and randomize them or choose 10 questions and randomize them. Um, you can also, let's see. Hmm. If you go in, if I do edit here, I believe it's um, if you hit edit on the part. Oh, itself. thank you. Yep, thank you. There you go. So in this particular case, because I have not added questions into a question pool, um, it doesn't give me that option, but I can go in there and I can say, um, pull them from a pool here if I want to, or you can actually order the ones that you've entered manually by selecting um, as listed on a quest assessment questions page, which means they'll be as listed one through five, or if you select random within part, then now everything, those first five questions within part one will be selected randomly, if that makes sense. And then you just save it. There is a save button. Sorry, I'm having to move your little thumbnail video pictures around to see all the buttons. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, another good question, are all the time settings uh, Eastern Standard Time for everyone? Yeah, so Sakai basically will adjust what the student sees based on the time zone that they have set in Sakai. Um, so when you put something in an Eastern Standard Time, if a student is visiting you from a different time zone and they've got it set in Sakai, um, then it'll show them the due date in their current time zone. But they need to have that set inside um, Sakai in order for that to be correct. Um, might be a nice thing to, I think maybe, and I can verify this too, or Michael, maybe you can real quick. I think there's some information about that on the Keep Teaching page, um, certainly on the Keep Learning page for students to be able to figure out how to change the time zone to where they are in Sakai. Yeah, let's see, uh, I'll take a look around. Okay, and we can share that with you. And actually we just run out of time. It's 12 o'clock on the button. So um, I will stop formal workshop at this point and just say thank you for coming and I hope this was helpful to you. And again, if there's stuff that we didn't cover, we didn't go deep enough into, or questions that we weren't able to answer, we missed somehow, um, please feel free to email us at keepteaching at duke.edu. Or um, we have office hours. We're still doing office hours every day through the end of this week and probably beyond. We'll have more information about that soon. Um, every day from one to three. And there's a link on the Keep Teaching page on the right-hand side that takes you into office hours. You can be paired up um, with whoever is working office hours one-on-one -on -one and, and work through some of these questions that you might have individually. All right, so thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Thank you. Sure. Michael, did you happen to see if the, anything about time zone stuff that we could share? I think that's, I'm sure that's on the Keep Teaching page somewhere. Yeah, I, I believe it is. Um... I mean, I we could show them how to set it. Yeah. Um, it's relatively simple, just so if any of their students need to. Yeah. Um, it's just as simple as clicking the waffle in the top and then going to your Sakai preferences. Um, right. Which, if I can find it, I have to keep moving these thumbnails around. So there's my little waffle up at the top, if I want to do that. And then there's the preferences option here. And then you have a time zone and you just choose your nearest city <laughs> or your time zone. There you go. Great. And so just whatever you set from then will yep. carry over. Grief. It's got some options there. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Right. But the deal being that even though you as the instructor will put in the times relevant to your time zone, it'll alter based on what the students have selected here in this time zone option. Yeah, that's right.